In the last PowerPoint, we examined the dual nature of light, how its behavior can be characterized as both a wave and a particle. The idea that specific photons of light could be associated with very specific wavelengths and energies was the key for Niels Bohr, a Danish physicist working in the early 20th century. He made the first step towards the quantum mechanical model of the atom. His model of the atom, while not complete, is still useful to us today as it has some of the major components of the quantum mechanical model, and it's often easier for us to visualize than the full quantum mechanical structure of the atom. In this PowerPoint, we'll examine the basics of Bohr's model, as well as some of its limitations. The basis of Bohr's model of the atom is the phenomenon of atomic emission. Elements, when they are placed in a high energy environment, can emit light. As you know from the flame test that you conducted in lab, if you put solutions of salts into a flame, you can get the flame to turn different colors. Now, The colors you see result from the emission of light by certain elements the metallic ions present in the salt compound. You can actually identify the metals present based on the colors you see. A red flame indicates a compound that contains calcium. Purple indicates potassium ions and orange is produced by sodium ions. The same phenomenon is responsible for the different colors of neon lights. So there are actually a wide variety of different gaseous elements enclosed in neon lights that produce the different colors you can see. If you apply a high voltage across the gas in the tube, you can get these different elements to glow, each with their own characteristic color. Astronomers also use the characteristic light emission of different elements to identify what's present in stars and other celestial objects, like this remnant of a supernova in the Crab Nebula. By examining the wavelengths of light being emitted, they can identify the specific elements that are present. In this case, those left behind after the death of a star. Astronomers can identify the elements present because each element has a very specific pattern or spectrum of light emission. Imagine taking white light and passing it through a prism. What you'd see is a rainbow because the prism separates that white light into all of the different frequencies or colors that it contains and white light contains all of the different visible colors. So this rainbow is known as a continuous spectrum. Now the story would be a little different if you were to pass the light from say a neon light or the light emitted by a flame that contains a compound with sodium in it. In this case, instead of a continuous spectrum, you'd get a series of distinct thin lines of color. These patterns are known as bright line emission spectra. And these lines of color represent the different wavelengths of light that are being emitted by that particular element. The pattern of light emission or the bright lines is different for each element. Sodium has a very different pattern than hydrogen or calcium or mercury, for example. When you look at light emitted from stars or supernova, you can separate that light into these bright line emission spectra, and you can identify the unique contributions of individual elements. Niels Bohr was the first scientist to make the connection between these unique patterns of light emission for each element 
and the internal structure of the atom. Bohr proposed that these light emission patterns were created by electrons emitting energy as they moved from higher energy levels to lower ones within the atom. So Bohr's model is the first to propose specific positions for electrons in the atom. And according to Bohr, Electrons didn't just exist any point outside the nucleus, they only orbited the nucleus in specific paths, which he called energy levels. And the concept is similar to the way planets occupy specific orbital paths around the sun. And sometimes this model is thought of as the planetary model of the atom. Now Bohr stated that electrons could occupy energy levels close to the nucleus or farther away. And those closer to the nucleus have lower potential energy than those farther away. He labeled his energy levels with integers. One, two, three, and so forth. The lower numbers indicate lower energy and a closer position to the nucleus. So based on the atomic emission spectra, Bohr also proposed that electrons could move between these energy levels, but in order to do so, they had to absorb or emit the exact difference in energy between the levels. So when electrons move from lower energy to higher energy levels, they absorb the exact amount of energy they need from their environment. And when electrons move from higher energy levels to lower energy levels, like that depicted here, they have to get rid of that difference in energy. And they do so in the form of light. And as we know from Einstein's work with the photon nature of light, specific energies of light can be associated with very specific frequencies and wavelengths. And when we look at atomic emission spectra, those very distinct thin lines that we see reflect the exact energy difference between energy levels for the particular element involved. Bohr actually calculated the potential energy that should be associated with the energy levels he proposed. Those values are listed here in units of joules. Now the more negative the value, the lower the potential energy associated with that level, and the closer that energy level is to the nucleus. As you move further away from the nucleus, the potential energy values actually become less negative or closer to zero. One way of thinking of these values is as a measure of the potential of the electron to simply move closer to the nucleus. So electrons do feel an attractive force for the nucleus because of that electrostatic attraction between the positive charge of protons and the negative charge of electrons. The farther the electrons are away from the nucleus, the higher their potential energy or less negative it is because they actually have the potential to move closer to the nucleus. The values are negative because technically if an electron is very far away from the nucleus at an infinite distance, for example, it's too far away to feel that attractive force. And so we say it has a potential energy of zero. Now, in lower energy environments, electrons tend to occupy the energy levels closest to the nucleus, those with the lowest potential energy. We call these this the ground state of the atom. But in higher energy environments, the electrons can absorb energy. But if they absorb energy, 
they have to move to a new energy level, a higher energy level. And since they can only occupy very specific energy levels with very specific potential energies, they have to absorb the exact difference between the lower energy level and that higher one that they jump to. So in this diagram, we see on the left a picture of electrons essentially jumping from lower energy levels to higher ones as they absorb energy. In this case, they absorb light. All matter does tend towards lower potential energy over time, and electrons are no exception they will drop back down to lower energy levels as depicted here on the right. But in doing so, they have to emit that exact difference in energy between the higher energy levels and the lower ones. And they do so in the form of electromagnetic radiation. So the atomic emission spectra represent uh, energy emissions in the level of visible light, but not all of these energy transitions are actually associated with visible light emissions. For example, these larger jumps from higher energy levels back down to the first energy level, that closest to the nucleus, are associated with uh, energetic radiation emissions with shorter wavelengths, like x-rays. Visible light absorption and emission, like those associated with atomic emission spectra, are actually um, usually associated with transitions from higher energy levels back down to the second energy level, not the first. So electrons must absorb energy first in order to jump to higher energy levels. And since the energy they absorb has to, again, be that exact difference in energy between the two different levels, we can also observe what are known as absorption spectra for the different elements. So if you shine a continuous spectrum of light on an element, you'll find that it will absorb only specific frequencies of light. And those specific frequencies correspond to the energy associated with the exact difference between the energy levels for that particular atom. So the dark lines in this absorption spectra are those wavelengths or frequencies associated with those energies. And notice how they occur at the exact same position as the colored emission lines. And this, of course, is because it's the same energy difference between the electron levels. In an absorption spectra, the electrons are absorbing energy to jump from lower to higher levels. In an emission spectra, the electrons are emitting energy as they jump back down from those higher energy levels to the lower energy levels. But it's the same amount of energy in either direction. We still use Bohr's model today to describe atomic structure in a very simplistic manner. But it does have some significant limitations that you need to be aware of. The first is that it really only describes the hydrogen atom accurately. His calculated energy levels only fit that emission spectra absorb, observed for hydrogen. For other elements that have more complex emission spectra, Bohr's energy levels just can't predict all of those different transitions. So for other elements 
you need to have a model of the atom that it will allow for more electron transitions than are possible with Bohr's simple energy levels alone. A second limitation of Bohr's model was that he couldn't explain why those electrons stayed in those very specific energy levels. In fact, in his own description of his model, he admitted that the specific orbits or energy levels had a peculiar, mechanically unexplainable stability. Now, why were these energy levels unexplainable to Bohr? Well, according to classical physics, moving charged particles, like those negatively charged electrons, have to emit energy as they move. So those electrons continuously orbiting around the nucleus should be continuously emitting energy. In other words, you should be able to just turn off the lights and see the graphite in your pencil, for example, glowing because it's continuously emitting energy. But that doesn't happen. Furthermore, if those electrons are losing energy or emitting energy as they orbit, they shouldn't be able to stay in stable orbits they should quickly spiral into the nucleus as they lose energy. But we know that doesn't happen either. So Bohr's model isn't wrong necessarily. It's just that he couldn't explain it using the tools of physics that he had at that time. He couldn't explain why the electrons don't spiral into the nucleus. Why do they stay in those energy levels? So in order to explain Bohr's energy levels, we need to look at these electrons in the light of quantum theory. In summary, according to Bohr's model of the atom, electrons exist in discrete energy levels around the nucleus of the atom. And electrons can move between energy levels by absorbing or emitting the exact difference in energy between the levels. And the emission and absorption spectra of the elements can correspond to these exact differences in energy or energy level transitions. There are limitations to Bohr's model First, Bohr's calculated energy levels of the atom only correspond to the hydrogen spectrum. And second, the stability of the energy levels can't be explained by classical physics.